Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining um, this webinar on the IEA World Energy Investment 2019. Um, my name is Tim Gould. I'm the Head of Division for Energy Supply and Investment Outlooks here at the IEA. And I'm joined by, uh, I think, the entire team that put together this uh, World Energy Investment. You'll be hearing shortly um, from Mike Waldron, Alessandro Blasi, Alberto Toril, um, Yoko Naboka, and uh, Simon Bennett on different aspects of this work, um, after which uh, we would be very happy if you uh, wanted to ask any questions. You can do that um, by typing the questions into the browser um, for this webinar. Uh, we anticipate that the presentation of the material is going to take around half an hour, and then we have as much time as we need um, to go through any questions that you might have. A couple of words of introduction. Um, this is now the fourth year that the IEA has produced uh, a world energy investment. It's evolved each year, uh, and you may have noticed it's evolved again this year um, in important respects. Uh, um, the format is different, um, but also we are releasing the world energy investment in 2019, a full two months earlier than we did uh, last year. Um, and that has a number of benefits. I mean, it reflects the uh, priority from the executive director here about bringing timely information to uh, different stakeholders, and, but it's also meant that we've come in in advance of the SEM this time around, and, and, and we think that particularly for the investment finance track, but I think more generally for the SEM, um, this type of information, this type of analysis um, really helps to provide some context for the discussions that are going to be held um, in Vancouver in a couple of weeks' time. Um, we are focusing very much in this work on the state of play now. So there's a lot of data on 2018. There are some indications about what we think is going on in 2019. Um, but one thing that we've done this year, perhaps a little bit more systematically in the, than in the past, is to try and understand the implication of these trends by benchmarking uh, the data that we see today uh, against the scenarios that we have uh, in the World Energy Outlook. Uh, you'll hear us talk about two scenarios uh, one is the new policy scenario. That really reflects all the things that we know about today. So all the policies that we see in place, all of the intentions that governments have announced. So it includes all of the elements of different uh, nationally determined contributions under Paris. We don't speculate as to how those positions might evolve in, evolve in the future, but this is really feedback to decision makers on the direction that the energy system appears to be heading in at the moment. And the other scenario that we talk about is the sustainable development scenario, the different types of construct. There we fix the endpoint. We fix an endpoint in 2040 that's consistent with the Paris Agreement, that's consistent with the UN Sustainable Development Goals relating to energy. So it's full universal access to modern energy. Um, and it's also involving a dramatic reduction in, in air pollutants. And then we work our way back to the present and find out what would it take to reach those goals over the coming decades. And the difference between those two scenarios is an important sort of element that we can use to analyze the adequacy or otherwise of today's trends. I think that's uh, enough uh, background. So what I'd like to do now is to pass it over uh, to Mike Waldron, who's the head of our investment team, um, to start the presentation. OK, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, of course, what we present today will be uh, a snapshot of some of the highlights of the investment report. Uh, very much focused on some of the clean um, energy and financing themes that we, we see. Um, but of course, there's, a, there's also much more in the report um, than what we're able to, to publish here. Um, so we encourage you to go to the, to the website, which is on the cover page, which I just went through very, very fast. Um, but essentially, the core of the results from the investment report is this uh, look across different sectors over the energy investment in 2018, which you see on the slide here. And the interesting thing we found this year is that first, for the first time since we published this report, um, the IEA sees a more stable year-on-year -year picture for, for energy investments uh, following three years of decline. So there were not large gains or losses in any one of the high-level sectors, um, but the sectors in which we did see growth in investment in 2018 uh, were centered around the category that we'll refer to as fuel supply. So fuel supply would include oil and gas supply, which is the purple bar, the purple columns, uh, coal supply, which is more coal mining um, because the coal power generation is under the power sector on the left, 
And then the category on the right says renewables and for transport and heat, uh, but this also includes biofuels production capacity. And in each of these three areas, we saw an increase. Um, of course, the, the bar, the column on the right has to be netted for um, the decrease that we saw in, in solar thermal heating, um, but the biofuels did go up. Um, what was driving most of the increase in fuel supply investment uh, was actually the oil and gas sector. So if you go back to the uh, purple columns on the left, um, it's hard to see from the 1% change that we show up there, but the upstream portion, so the dark purple of oil and gas spending actually rose by 4%. And this was the fastest growing sector um, across all the different energy sectors. Um, so perhaps not um, a positive news necessarily for clean energy transition, um, but this is where we saw more money going um, on, a, on a growth basis in investment in, in 2018. Now, part of the bounce back in fuel supply spending that we saw in 2018 stems from a, a lack of growth in investment in energy efficiency, which was basically stable uh, for a second year in a row. And my colleague Simon will discuss a bit more of the dynamics in that sector, um, but what we see is despite the good cost effectiveness of efficiency investments in many areas, um, there's been limited progress in expanding policy coverage, uh, which was particularly evident in the building sector, which uh, where we saw spending decline for the first time in this report. Um, for the third year in a row, we see the power sector, which is the columns on the left, as the largest investment sector, so larger than oil and gas. And while this lead stems partly from shifting costs in both sectors, um, the trend of more investment going into the power sector also reflects the growing importance of electricity um, in the overall energy system. And in our recent global energy and CO2 um, emissions uh, trends report that we, the IEA put out in March, um, we found that electricity demand growth uh, grew twice as fast as that of overall energy demand. So the role of electricity uh, has been increasing. Um, nevertheless, the lead of the power sector has narrowed by half since 2016 or, um, and to about 35 billion in 2018. And this is for a few reasons. One of which is the lower investment in fossil fuel power, primarily coal, lower coal investment in China, um, but also somewhat of a retrenchment of investment in, in gas power in the United States from albeit very high levels that we've seen the past few years. Um, but also the fact that we saw renewable power investment edge down. And this was due to um, both declining costs, but also a flat picture for net additions year on year. Um, but one important aspect of renewable investment is that a lot of the decline was led by China, whereas we saw renewables investment pick up um, in the other parts of the world. So when we're speaking of the, the geographic distribution of investment in 2018, um, one analysis we did was to look at energy investment by different income groups. And it should come as no surprise that there's a strong link between income levels and the level of investments. Um, and the distribution of this investment around the world has very impl important implications um, for both energy, but also broader sustainable development goals. So, Nearly 90% of energy investment in 2018 was concentrated in high and upper middle income countries and regions, which is illustrated by the two bars um, at the top of the graph on the left. Um, these are also areas that tend to benefit from relatively well-developed financial systems with good availability of domestic credit um, and also uh, liquid uh, markets for investment. And this is something we looked at more deeply in the financing and funding uh, trends section of the, of the world energy investment. Um, but when you actually look at where the investment is going versus where the population of the world is, you find a mismatch um, that's emerging or has been there for a while, actually. Um, so lower, middle, and low-income countries accounted for less than 15% of global energy investment in 2018, uh, but yet they contain well over 40% of the world's population. Um, within this group, which is the column on the very bottom. Um, India has actually been the strongest or the fastest grower in recent years, uh, with particularly rising uh, spending in the power sector, particularly in renewables, but also in grids, um, while spending in sub-Saharan Africa, which is a focus of, of IEA work uh, later this year, um, has declined in recent years, mostly due to less investment in fuel supply, many, much of which was going to serve international markets uh, rather than domestic needs in, in any case. Uh, when we look ahead, the largest investment needs remain concentrated in the two uh, bars, the two income groups um, at the top. But to meet sustainable development goals, 
um, overall spending needs to shift from today's levels to rebalance towards the fast growing needs of the lower middle and lower income countries. So now we're going to shift and talk about some of the sectoral trends we see in energy investments, and I'll pass it off to my colleague, Alessandro Flazzi. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mike, and good morning, good afternoon to everybody. So one other thing so we try to um, describe in the World Energy Investment Report is how the uh, energy companies try to uh, implement the new strategies or looking for new opportunities as a reaction to increasing changes in terms of policy, market, and technology context. And one clear trend we found out is that when it's possible, there is an increasing preference of companies to embark in projects that has the ability to deliver more quickly. So overall, we have estimated that the energy industry is able now to bring capacity to market on average more than 20% faster than at the beginning of the decade. Now, as far as concern of the oil and gas sector, uh, further to a notable shift toward shale, which today accounts for about one quarter of total upstream investment, in the conventional area, which is the one that uh, provides the most of the oil and gas supply, we have seen a project that has been redesigned, simplified, and standardized when it's possible. Uh, with the primary goal to reduce upfront capital investment and uh, to improve time to market. Uh, of course, uh, this is an approach that uh, allows company to reduce uh, on exposure to long-term uncertainties since uh, the costs uh, tend to be recovered quicker. But this trend is not only common to the oil and gas sector. We also have noted some uh, um, shift in the power sector mainly dictated by the increasing relevance of investment in renewables uh, over the years. Um, since 2000, the share of uh, uh, renewables in global power generation investment has increased from about 45% to 65%, while fossil fuel generation investment has halved to about one quarter on the total. And, uh, uh, we note that there is smarter projects and competitive bidding in some uh, markets with good regulatory uh, framework, which allows uh, the realization of projects in a, in, a, in a faster way. So overall, we estimate that about three quarters of upstream oil and gas spending and about two thirds of generation addition are now built in about three years or less. And this is this shares just at the beginning of decade were less than 60% as far as concerned oil and gas project and 50% for power respectively. So uh, one key message we believe is that from an investor perspective, a fundamental criteria to navigate uncertain times is trying to better to manage better the capital at risk, and the companies are looking for strategies that are able to protect them against long-term uncertainty. Another thing which has been mentioned at the very beginning by Tim is uh, this year we have tried to, for the first time, to put in context the current level of investment with what would be needed uh, in the future according to the different scenario. And to do this, we basically try to address two fundamental questions. The first one is if the current amount of investment is sufficient. And the second question is if current investment trends are consistent with our energy security and the sustainability goals. So as far as concern of the first question, the answer is no. Because whatever scenario we consider, the energy supply investment needed to increase. Here we have compared the 2018 investment with the two main scenarios of the world energy outlook. The new policy scenario, which uh, trying to simplify is the closest scenario to the current energy trends, and the sustainable development scenario, which is the one that would meet uh, uh, Paris, but also other sustainability goals. 
And in both cases, we, it's evident that the level of spending is not sufficient about, uh, to, to meet the two scenarios. For the second question about uh, uh, energy security and sustainability goals, the answer is no again. And here is a, uh, as a two dimension. In fossil fuel supply, what we need is a reallocation of capital spent by different fuels. For instance, investment in gas supply and biofuel supply needs to improve, while coal on the other way has to be reduced, uh, coal supply has been reduced significantly, especially in uh, SDS. As far as concern of the power sector, um, the 2018 investment total is comparable to what we need in MPS, but is about one third lower of what we require in SDS. Uh, notably, spending on renewable power should need to double about uh, to reach about 600 billion per year by 2030, even taking into account renewables uh, cost continuing to falling. And this should need to be accompanied by more spending in nuclear as well as the electricity network. So to, to sum up, what we believe is that currently the world is not investing enough in those traditional components of the energy supply system to keep a pace of current consumption partners and is not investing enough in cleaner energy technologies uh, that are required to change course. So whichever way we look at the scenario and the investment, we are storing up risk for the future. And now I'm passing to my colleague Albert. Thank you very much, Alessandro. And now, as said, we are going to continue the presentation by moving uh, to speak about what's happening and what the different trends on investment in the power sector. Uh, we will start talking by, by uh, coal-fired power plants when we see that the, uh, with this trajectory of investment is also crucial for the future energy system. Uh, last year, uh, final investment decisions for new coal-fired plants, a leading indicator for investment, declined to near the lowest level this century at just over 20 gigawatts and 80% lower than 2010. Uh, the sad drop in this decade has been led by China spurred by overcapacity and local pollution concern, and to a lesser extent by India, where generators face declining utilization rates and risks related to reliable power purchase, purchase by gas truck power distributed, uh, distribution companies. Uh, in the meantime, global retirements that are mostly in the US and Europe were at near record levels due to capacity reaching the end of its economic life, competition reducing utilization and revenues, and the impact of policies to tackle local air pollution. Nevertheless, overall, coal power fleet continued to grow in 2018 by 8 gigawatts, with a geographical mismatch between where new capacity is being added and where old capacity is retired, although this was far lower than the 50 gigawatt uh, expansion that uh, we saw in 2017. Uh, we see that in developing Asian countries, the coal fleet expanded to 35 uh, gigawatts, albeit at the lowest pace in the decade. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, the coal fleet has been shrinking since 2012. What this really implies is that without a rapid phase out of FIDs for an abated plan, as well as carbon capture technology or incentives for early retirement, coal power and the high CO2 emissions it produces will remain as part of the global energy system for many years to come. Uh, sorry, and uh, when we come to what happens to low carbon generation sources and the impact of those on those, uh, we see discontinued uh, investment in coal plants, which have a long life cycle, appear to be aimed at filling a growing gap between soaring demand for power and a leveling off of expected generation from low carbon investment, both renewable and nuclear. Uh, before continuing, uh, we would like to just add that when we made this analysis for the first time in the first edition of the World Energy Investment in 2016, we had a different, uh, totally different expectation on how the next following year would look like. Uh, just remember, 2015 was the year uh, when Paris Agreement was made. Uh, but today, as we will see in a minute, uh, we have a very different trend with this gap widening. Uh, so despite a very good progress in solar PV and wind in recent years, with the stagnation of overall in renewable investment and reduced role of hydropower, 
the expected generation from the investment made in 2018 is level enough. Uh, this is consistent with the data that the IA released last week showing a stalling of renewable capacity additions. Uh, this is reinforced as well by the slow progress in the expansion of nuclear investment, particularly also of China, which has underpinned much of the growth in recent years. I think that the cursor is enough. There we go. <laughs> Okay, uh, so at the same time, as we can see on the on the line, uh, on the yellow line, uh, electricity demand growth soared in 2016, growing by 4%, a message that the IEA already communicated in March in the Global Energy and CO2 Status Report that is illustrating the graph, the growing graph uh, between consumption needs and the supply of low, car low carbon power, which has been filled by investment in coal and gas instead. Uh, while both IES scenarios would require a feasible reallocation of capital towards low carbon power, the accelerated decarbonization and electrification that marks the sustainable development scenario will require a double spending on renewable power and much more investment in nuclear amid a rising level of spending on electricity networks. And this slide, uh, we analyze the role of corporate power purchase agreement for renewable projects and we see that even as overall renewable power spending declined somewhat in 2018, we see evolving trends in underlying business models. In the past years, nearly all utility scale renewable investment to date have benefited from long term pricing under policy schemes such as feeding tariffs and increasingly competitive options for long term contracts, as well as physical power purchase agreement with utilities subject to purchase obligations. But recently, there is a growing trend among corporations to procure renewable power, uh, power directly uh, independently of uh, government plans. To satisfy this increasing demand, new contractor structure has emerged that help corporations to demonstrate clear additionality in their procurement and provide a degree of price certainty to renewable developers. Uh, renewable investment, on, uh, we can see in the figure, renewable investment on uh, corporate PPAs jumped by one third in 2018 to nearly $15 billion, and now it accounts for over 5% of global solar PV and wind spending. Um, the United States has been the market leader, as per by companies such as Facebook, Microsoft, and even ExxonMobil. Uh, we see this uh, business model also um, starting to take off in Europe, but development remains more limited in other parts of the world. Uh, corporate PPAs has grown mostly in competitive markets where there are clear regulations for contracting and reselling power, especially from utilities who provide billing, balancing, and physical delivery services, and certification that facilitates a seasonality. In the United States, for example, renewable tax credits has not had their use. Nevertheless, if we if we we take a look on the right uh, on the right figure uh, and uh, how uh, this impacts uh, energy, it is clear that a much larger scale up of spending will be needed for corporate PPA uh, to make more of a then in commercial and industrial power demand. As we can see, a sevenfold growth in cumulative spending will be needed to cover 10% of current commercial and industrial demand in the United States and Europe. This suggests stepping into a much larger pool of corporate buyers, which can raise additional challenges in terms of credit risk evaluation and project structuring. And to conclude here, I will say that uh, there is more detail in this world energy investment uh, outlook, uh, where we look uh, more deeply at some of the financial risk management strategies beyond subsidies that are being used by developers. Now I'll pass the floor to my colleague Joko, who will continue, Joko Nuboka, who will continue talking about the different trends in financing for renewable generation. Thank you, Alberto. We also look at sources of finance for energy investment and we broadly categorize them for new, new power assets into balance sheet financing and project financing. As the left chart of this slide shows, we found that about 85% of power investments in 20, 2018 were financed on the balance sheets of investing entities such as power utilities, invest, uh, in independent power producers, and consumers in the case of distributed generation. The use of project finance for financing new projects has grown in recent years, 
and its its largest contribution is now in the utility scale, scale renewable power sector. And in renewable power, as the as the right chart shows you, power um, project finance is general is in general more commonly used in the United States and Europe. And it continues to play an important role in the United States, where recent tax code changes have not undermined the availability of tax equity for solar PV and wind. In Europe, project financing for onshore wind has been stable in recent years, but that for offshore wind has grown as the maturity of the technology has increased and the risks have fallen. This is thanks to competitive bidding for long-term contracts and also system operators assuming grid connection risks in some markets. Renewable project finance has also spread, spread into other regions such as Australia, Japan, and Latin America, boosted by policies to help manage the risks. So overall, there is a strong link between policies and financing for power sector. For example, we also found that over 95% of power sector investment was made by companies operating under fully regulated revenues or long-term contractual mechanisms, such as based on feed-in tariff or auction for renewables, so that they can manage the revenue risk associated with variable wholesale market pricing. In many countries with competitive wholesale markets, short-term price signals alone remain too low to trigger investment. There is more detail on this topic in the finance, financing section of the report. And the next slide shows an example of recent developments in renewable power financing. In the US, in addition to policy support at the federal and state level, the availability of finance has continued to improve with more players and products entering the market. In the country, the investment in distributed solar PV was around $15 billion in 2018, the second largest market after China, and the market has remained one of the most dynamic, dy most dynamic in terms of installations, although capital costs are relatively high compared to the global average. The left chart shows installation by top three developers by payment mechanism. And this, this shows that while fewer in installations are now made by these top developers, payment mechanisms for distributed solar PV in the US continue to evolve towards increased consumer ownership compared with leasing arrangements or PPAs with third parties. This reflects a better availability of financing options for consumers and the, and the desire by developers to ease upfront capital expenditure. A number of financial, financial institutions now offer solar loans, which have helped to fa facilitate direct ownership. Developers and financing companies are also using the secondary market to refinance the leases and, and contracts on their balance sheets, as well as their portfolios of solar solar loans, so that, so that the financing costs and risks are spread among more investors. And for example, in 2018, as shown in the, in the chart in the middle, a record amount of asset-backed securities, or ABS, based on U.S. distributed solar PV projects was issued. It, it was over $2 billion, equal to around 15% around of primary financing. So the, and the, these developments in financing options have helped to keep the cost of financing relatively stable, although U.S. benchmark interest rates rate rose. So as the chart in the right shows, the cost of financing for large portfolios of distributed PV projects remained broadly stable in, in 2018 compared to two years ago with somewhat more debt used to finance projects and an increased diversity of equity sponsors. Securitization such as ABS that I just talked about 
It's part of the larger universe of green bonds, which have emerged as important financing tools for renewables and, and energy efficiency for both primary financing and secondary financing. As you can see in this slide, the green bond market rose to another record level in 2018 with the issuance of nearly $170 billion. Growth actually slowed significantly to 3% compared to the previous year. In 2017, it was boosted by high transaction volumes for mortgage-backed securities from Fannie Mae's Green Rewards green Program in the U.S., which is categorized into energy efficiency in this chart. The largest issuance of green bonds across all sectors came from the United States, but there is also, also growth among European markets, China, and other emerging, emerging economies. In Europe, initiatives such as the U.S. High-Level Experts Group on Sustainable Finance are seeking to further strengthen the role of environmental factors in the financial system and in finance, financial products. Now I'll, I'll give the floor to my colleague Simon Bennett. Great. Thanks, Yoko, and hi to everybody who's, who's on the line. I'm going to present some of our work that we've done on uh, energy efficiency investment and then some stuff on uh, research and, and new technologies. Uh, and with those few slides to go, I think this is a good moment just to remind all of you that you can submit questions uh, to a Q&A session afterwards using the, the online interface. So let's continue on from where we were with looking at green bonds and the, uh, the share of that that's going to efficiency projects by talking about our global energy efficiency uh, investment analysis that we've done this year, continuing on from uh, from several previous years where we've tried to work out just how much is being invested in efficiency around the world. And the, the conclusion that we've come to this year, after some fairly modest growth in, in previous years, is that actually there's been a, uh, a stalling of energy efficiency investment. And in a way, we can link this directly, uh, this sort of slowing and then stalling trend, uh, to the results that we presented for the total uh, energy sector, where the growing dem uh, demand for energy products in most sectors uh, around the world is what's driving up uh, investment in delivering those fuels and has led to the, to the trends that we're seeing at the, the global level across the energy picture. So efficiency is a key component of uh, affecting all of the, uh, the trends in other sectors as well. Now, the, the total in 2018 was around 240 billion, and we look across the building sector the transport sector and the industry sector. And that's about the same as, as I said, in 2017. Now, the, the main factor uh, relating to the stalling in 2018 was actually that uh, we saw lower spending on energy efficiency uh, for buildings than uh, since we first started doing this estimate with the first production of the World Energy Investment Report in, in 2016. Uh, so uh, the, that's the result of, you know, complex uh, interplays between construction patterns, regulation, uh, government spending, and other things that we, we try and bring into that, uh, that number. Um, but in general, it's not the result of, we don't think of cost reductions uh, in energy efficiency projects. We still think that uh, the, the, sort of the, the scale of the industry is generally delivering um, buildings refurbishment and interventions they have fairly significant cost tags associated with them because of the unique nature of, of many of those projects. Now, there are opportunities with increasing digitalization uh, to reduce the cost of efficiency, and we do expect that to, to be happening uh, going forward. In terms of transport energy efficiency spending, uh, there was a slight growth in 2018, um, and there was a continued rise in, in market share around the world. Um, for the light duty trucks, that's you know, SUVs and, and larger vehicles. And so that's the dominant trend in the, uh, the car and, and uh, sort of smaller freight vehicle sector. And that's actually uh, having an impact on the total uh, efficiency investment and efficiency outcomes. Um, and the other thing in the transport sector that we, we try and monitor fairly closely is uh, electric vehicle sales. And this is a good opportunity to plug the uh, global EV outlook that will be published by the IEA in the next couple of weeks 
uh, where we look at electric vehicle sales more closely. But it is possible to say that because of the high incremental cost of efficiency in, uh, in electric vehicles at the moment with their, uh, their current prices, the uh, level of, efficient, of electric vehicles that are sold, which are, uh, were up to 2 million last year, is actually having an impact on the total uh, transport sector efficiency investment now. Um, so I think the, the other thing that links back from these sort of dollar numbers to the global big picture is that you know, across uh, energy efficiency, we're actually seeing a relatively static policy environment uh, with lackluster progress on implementing new efficiency policies or increasing the stringency of existing policies. And that's something the IEA said before, but it's worth noting that I think across energy efficiency spending, uh, government policy is absolutely critical to underpinning uh, the business case and uh, driving forward the, uh, the finance into that sector. Okay. So slightly changing gears now as we move from uh, energy efficiency to uh, the section that we have at the, the end of our report on uh, research, development, and innovation. This is a part of the report where we try to track some of the trends in what is being spent on new technologies for the future of the energy sector, uh, the kinds of technologies that we would hope to see deployed uh, for clean energy transitions. And uh, we're in a unique position at the IEA to be able to track public energy uh, research and development spending uh, because we have a great data set of our member countries who submit data on where they're spending uh, each year in terms of the, the different technologies as well. Uh, and we complement that with other data to provide this global total. And the global total in 2018, we think, was around $26 billion um, uh, in terms of the public budget. And that's a 5% increase year on year, um, which is similar to the increase we saw 2016, 2017. So we've actually got uh, you know, relatively robust rising in spending from uh, governments across the energy picture. Now, uh, most of that is going to, to low carbon technologies. And next week, we're going to publish some more detailed uh, numbers on just the low carbon part of this research story. But actually, when you look at the, uh, the research spending in the context of uh, in the context of GDP uh, by, uh, from these countries, we're actually not seeing that countries are significantly spending more of their uh, economic output on energy research as we might expect them to uh, with the scale of the new technologies that are going to need to be deployed for clean energy transitions. Now, when we look at individual countries a little bit more closely, and we see that uh, among those countries, China is actually one that is spending a higher percentage of its uh, of its GDP on uh, energy R&D, uh, whereas other countries are stagnating or in some cases even declining. So the, the trends that we're seeing at the moment are, are in some cases the result of China stepping up its efforts on energy research and development. Now in terms of the total numbers where we're talking about this 26 billion, it is striking to note uh, that in fact the just the largest uh, two European automakers have uh, combined energy or combined R&D budgets that are higher than uh, all of the government budgets that we track. And that's a good moment just to say that in the report, um, we don't just look at the, the public spending on energy R&D. We do have some data on corporate reports and, and private um, spending on, on research. There isn't time in this presentation to present that, but we are going to present briefly uh, some work that we've done on venture capital uh, markets for uh, and new energy technologies, which are predominantly clean energy technologies. Well, thanks very much, Simon, and thanks very much to all those that presented. We're gonna, now going to move to hey, a last slide. I'm sorry, I've, I've interrupted before the end here. Simon, you carry on. Well, I think that's, that's a, thank you for, for a good hint that we're, <laughs> we need to be bringing the presentation to a, to a conclusion with this, uh, these final messages on, on venture capital investment. So if we just bring up the, bring up the slide here, we, what we'll see is that there has actually been uh, a big increase in energy sector VC activity in 2018. So this is a, quite, an, quite an interesting story because uh, whereas last year we said that we were back around uh, the levels of VC activity that we saw before 2012, before the clean tech bust, in 2018 we've gone quite a long way beyond that. Um, and the dynamics beneath that 
high level figure in terms of just the, the share of transport, mostly electric vehicle technologies in those deals, uh, and the fact that China is now dominant in terms of total deal value, uh, even if it isn't dominant in terms of the number of deals, uh, do suggest some, some interesting patterns that are happening. Uh, and we do see a, a great number of uh, energy companies and companies from outside the energy sector investing in uh, early stage energy startups just in uh, in order to learn about new technologies and see that as a different way into uh, research and development in a in an uncertain energy world uh, so I, i'll close there uh, and we'll move on tim gets his opportunity <laughs> to present the conclusion slide well thanks very much simon apologies for interrupting just now um i won't say i mean you can see the conclusions on the uh, on the, on the slide here i think i just return to a couple of things that people have said I and mean, we've emphasized throughout the importance of policy that came through very strongly in the discussion on, um, on, on, on all areas essentially of low carbon investment, um, whether that's in relation to renewables, certainly in relation to nuclear, and also in relation to uh, energy efficiency and, 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 and naturally R&D as, as well. Um, I think um, Alessandro was talking about, you know, whichever way you look at this, you see some important risks. Um, I think we would, probably sum it up like this, or at least our executive director summed it up like this in our, in our press release. The world is, is not currently investing enough in the traditional elements of supply if consumption carries on the way it's been going at the uh, you know, according to recent trends. But I think the important area for SEM is also that we're clearly not investing anything like enough in a range of clean energy technologies in order to change course uh, for the future. Um, Please send in your questions. We've had a couple in uh, already. Um, one more sort of procedural. Um, will we be able to download the slide deck? Uh, I'm looking at our friends from the SEM Secretariat. We shall certainly make these slides uh, available to all the participants um, in, this, uh, in this webinar uh, as soon as we're done. Um, there was a question came through on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So have you looked at the numbers for CCUS? Um, how much investment is going in at the moment? Are there any signs of, of, a, of, of, a, of a shift there and how does that compare with what might be needed in the future okay thanks Tim and thanks for the for the question uh, there's the opportunity to highlight that there is uh, some discussion of investments in other um, clean energy technologies uh, that we feel are sort of off track in terms of their level of development and deployment for clean energy transition uh, CCS is, is one of those, um, but not an area where we are able to put precise investment figures or spending figures on 2018, uh, because as far as we know, uh, the spending was really happening last year in just one large-scale project, uh, which was uh, came online in China for an enhanced oil recovery project at the Jilin oil field. Uh, we don't actually know the uh, the total investment costs associated with that project, but. Last year, we did a much more detailed analysis of uh, CCS or CCUS uh, and showed how the, the spending of the budgets that were released by many governments around 10 years ago have been spent, but are now coming to the end of, um, uh, of their availability. And we don't have the projects uh, in, or we didn't have the projects at that time in the pipeline to see uh, a scale up that we might hope for. Uh, what we are able to say this year is that a number of projects have been announced and um, uh, something that's particularly interesting is in 2018 six new projects in Europe were announced all related to capturing the the CO2 from hydrogen production so in some ways the the momentum around hydrogen at the moment has actually given a new stimulus to, uh, to project developers in CCS um, in terms of whether that's sufficient to put us on track in CCS uh, I don't have the numbers of spending from our scenarios in front of me. I think the way that I would look at this is uh, think about what is the, the highest uh, number of projects or the highest amount of investment in CCS that you can imagine over the next 10 years, and that's probably what we should be spending on CCS. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, there was a comment that came through um, in relation to the first slide that we showed, which was the breakdown of investment in, in 2018. There was a small sliver at the top of the power sector investment um, on battery storage. Um, it's something we hear a lot about in the news, but it didn't seem to be a massive share of power sector investment. 
Um, what can we say about the trends on this? I think Alberto, would you like to say that one? Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, uh, we see, and it's important to remark that while pump hydro projects remain the largest of the new electricity uh, uh, storage, lithium batteries continue to be the far, by far the largest part of battery deployment. So we saw this memory in 2018 that rolled by 45% to a record level of 4 billion, um, combining both uh, grid scale and behind the meter installations. Uh, Cap spending on grid scale battery storage increased, let's say, by 30% compared to the previous year, totaling more than 1.2 gigawatts of um, installation in 2018. So the biggest deployments occur in Europe, uh, particularly in the United Kingdom and, and Germany, and the United States, that both of regions comprise half of the investment in 2018, supported by capacity mechanisms and contract mainly. Uh, while we saw China as the largest uh, region with the largest growth in 2018 by a fourfold. Uh, what we can say by behind the meter installations, they jumped by 60% in 2018, uh, almost reaching 1.9 gigawatts of capacity capacity additions. And in here, uh, Korea led the led the additions, uh, supported by tariff design that aim to see peak demand in industrial and commercial sectors. Uh, in terms of uh, what are the application and what are what are the main uh, capabilities of uh, of uh, these batteries uh, to make revenues, uh, we see that grid and ancillary services remain the main application of those deployments. But there has been a, a rise in investment in batteries directly integrated with the variable renewable plants, and we have actually a, a further uh, study and a further analysis on this in the financing and funding section of the World Energy Investment Report. Uh, thank you. I have, um, thanks very much, Alberto. I have a question on, uh, we mentioned during the presentation, I think Simon mentioned that the growth in EVs is having an effect on energy efficiency investment. So what is the, what is the nature, the dimensions, the, 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 the pace of that, of that effect, Simon? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I'll just take a, a second just to very quickly um, say something about what we are seeing in terms of growth of the electric vehicle market in, in 2018, uh, because it is, it is continues to be impressive that we have growth that's uh, uh, annually averaging between uh, 50 and 70 percent in terms of sales. And in 2018, it was uh, it was 70 percent growth, uh, which is the strongest rate of growth in EV sales since since 2013, bringing the total stock of electric vehicles to around uh, five million uh, and. In terms of the breakdown here, we're really talking about a, a market that is dominated by China with 1.1 million electric cars sold there uh, in 2018 alone. And so when we when we talk about that in the context of energy efficiency, uh, we don't consider the entire sales cost of every electric vehicle as being an investment in, in energy efficiency. Uh, what we do here, as we do with all of the other vehicles, uh, is we use market data to estimate what is the incremental or the additional cost of buying a more efficient vehicle compared to uh, the vehicle that in principle would have been bought otherwise. So often that's the, the kind of the market average. Uh, and electric vehicles, you know, if we take the cost that is paid by both governments and consumers to their sticker price, uh, they have a higher incremental cost uh, compared to the kind of the market average vehicle in that, in that vehicle size and power class. That's a little bit about the, the methodology we use. Uh, so when we add up that across 2 million vehicles, we get an impact on EV investment that is, uh, that is noticeable. And it's worth saying that that is in the context of a total car market uh, that, you know, I, I don't know if all the figures are in yet, but it certainly didn't grow significantly in 2018. It may have been uh, stable or, or shrinking. Thank you very much, um, Simon. There's a, um, a more general policy question about what kinds of policies would avoid, in, would avoid investment risks for the future of clean energy. Could you give us some examples? Uh, Mike, do you want to take that one? Yeah, um, it's definitely a broad question, and I think the way, best way to address it is to um, focus on different types of markets. And I would say first that the, the idea is not to necessarily avoid risks, but the idea is to better allocate risks in an efficient manner to the parties who can best manage them. So. 
for policy related risks or risks that private sector cannot manage. It's usually best allocated to the government, but um, there are many risks that the private sector um, can manage and increasingly can man would need to manage um, as clean energy is developed in a, in a cost effective and affordable manner. So just kind of unpacking that a bit more specifically, um, when you're thinking about markets where renewables, energy efficiency, other clean energy technologies, um, batteries or, or other clean energy is, is scaling up, so more in emerging markets, developing countries. Um, usually the first challenge for policies is just setting an adequate regulatory framework. Um, this includes having targets in energy law, um, integrated planning in the power sector, for example, between grids and, and generation, um, being able to establish a credible uh, remuneration framework, um, which gives projects basically some sort of certainty, a degree of certainty over their cash flows over the long run. Um, what's been successful in a number of emerging economies is the development of auction schemes um, to award these incentives on a competitive basis, which has helped to drive down costs. But of course, the bankability of the contract itself, the power purchase agreement, um, is very important. And here, um, having credit worthy and um, financially sustainable utilities or off takers is also very important. And the, the credit worthy counterparty part also is, is relevant for energy efficiency when you're talking about um, the credits of, of consumers or small and medium sized enterprises um, who could be making investments uh, on the ground. And then from a financing standpoint, um, we've seen a lot of markets that are, that are scaling up um, this need to have a limited amount of public finance, whether in the, in the, in the form of blended finance or, or guarantees um, to help de-risk um, some of the finance and, and de-risk the project overall. When we're thinking of markets with relatively higher shares of clean energy, so uh, let's take a market like Europe, um, where you have high shares of variable renewables in some markets already, um, you have energy efficiency, which is um, not yet meeting its potential, but has grown a lot. Um, some of the risks relate to the consolidation and the integration of these technologies into the market. So. Um, it's important at this phase to have a very integrated uh, view of energy planning, which includes both the supply and the demand side equally, um, which is still kind of a, um, uh, let's say, a frontier type practice in, in a number of countries around the world, um, but makes and, and helps utilities being able to um, earn regulated rates of return for investing just as much in non-wires alternatives as, as, as um, transmission and distribution infrastructure. Um, sticky points related to permitting of infrastructure for grids are also important, uh, particularly in these markets, which can hold up developments um, even as generation um, is brought online rather quickly. And then another area which we touched upon in this year's World Energy Investment is we see um, as governments decrease the amount of um, incentives they're making available to projects um, and better want to integrate variable renewables into markets. There's this um, ne necessity to expose these projects a bit more to market pricing over their lifetime. And here we discussed some of the financial mechanisms that the private sector is using, including the corporate PPAs, which we showed here, but also things like bank hedges, um, proxy revenue swaps, um, other types of financial arrangements that can help to supplement um, uh, what governments offer. And here, of course, even if, if projects such as offshore wind in Europe are being developed on a, on a zero price bid um, for wholesale, for, to, to basically earn their revenues on wholesale markets, governments play a very important role in terms of the market design, um, but also sometimes in terms of providing uh, the green infrastructure, so regulatory uh, remuneration for grids. Um, and last thing I would say is important for these risks is to better integrate the capital markets into the financing structure. So my colleague Yoko talked about um, asset-backed securities and, and green bonds. Um, so being able to uh, allow projects to access these lower co cost sources of financing from larger pools of capital um, is also very important. So that's a very broad view of the question, but I think covers many of the, the challenges ahead. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, we had a question about um, nuclear and particularly about how Europe might meet its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets uh, at the same time that, it's, uh, that the contribution of nuclear is, is going down. Um, I don't think we're going to take that here, but I just wanted to flag that this is an issue that we're looking at quite <coughs> closely at IEA. Uh, it it's, there remains the case that 
um, the average age of the nuclear fleet in advanced economies is around uh, the well, each the average age of reactors is about 40 years, and that's the, pretty much the design lifetime of these reactors. Um, so the question of lifetime extensions or retirements is coming up, uh, you know, uh, very strongly in, in, in many of the uh, advanced economies, and that the implications of that and the policy options related to that uh, are going to be the subject of uh, a piece of analysis that, in fact, we the IEA will be releasing um, just before the uh, SEM, um, and it will be available then at the SEM. So please look out for that next week, um, because we will be uh, we will be coming back to that uh, very topic. Um, we had a question on uh, transport sector um, finance, project finance. Do we have a detailed breakdown of project finance in the transport sector? So EV, R&D, non-EV, clean fuel productions, things like biofuels, alternative fuels, and so on. Um, Simon, would you like to say something, to say something about that? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And it's it's an interesting question. It's not one that I'm going to be able to take from the the, the project finance perspective, but I'll take it from the uh, the R&D angle that we've looked at in terms of uh, transport company spending. Uh, so, the, I mean, the, the first point here, I think, is uh, that as a, a, an honest response, we don't know exactly uh, what companies are spending on those two different research topics. It's very difficult often to be able to understand how much is going into uh, electric vehicles, how much is going into other key technologies that we need to improve efficiency in other parts of the transport system. Uh, and that also applies to the CapEx investments that uh, car companies are making in new production. Uh, often factories are being converted uh, or lines of production for vehicles are running so that they can produce uh, the, the platforms or the chassis for electric or non-electric cars at the same time. Um, but we, we do make an estimate for the, the total R&D spending on uh, kind of energy related technologies uh, for, by automotive companies and we estimate that to be uh, just over 40 billion in 2018 and the interesting thing there is that that's the total among those companies that continues to grow we're definitely seeing a response to the regulatory and social pressures on these companies uh, to invest more of their earnings in uh, development of, of new uh, technologies and new vehicles uh, and at the same time some of the the revenues that they're seeing from uh, all of their sunk costs in uh, previous well, internal combustion engine technologies uh, may begin to uh, to shrink or to falter and this sets up a really interesting dilemma I think for some of those country companies and it'll be interesting to see uh, what the future of that spending is, is going to be. I think one note that I would just make uh, is that when we talk about research and development for car companies there is a particular um, kind of strong inclusion of development costs for, for new products. And that makes it very difficult to compare R&D spending of companies with R&D spending of governments. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, um, Simon. Uh, one follow on from that, particularly on the biofuel side, um, perhaps Yoko, you could say a few words about um, money going into biofuels investment and particularly um, if we have anything on the um, spending on advanced biofuel technologies. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Kim. So, biofuel uh, investment, uh, investment in transport biofuels product, uh, we actually um, track investment in new production capacity for biofuel, biofuels. And in 2018, investments in, di in this sector increased by 12%, led by China and the US. And and in terms of conventional biofuels and advanced biofuels, we so far we only track advanced ethanol, cellulosic ethanol. And in the past five years, investment uh, in uh, out of the total uh, investment in biofuels sector, investment in ethanol, entire ethanol product, production capacity accounted for 80% of investment. And one, one, only one, one tenth of, of that went to advanced ethanol. So this remains very low. And, and overall, biofuels investment represented only less than 1% of the investment in fuel supply. And it was about 66, only 6 billion US dollars in 2018. And we, we, think that investment in the sector would need to increase sixfold in the next decade to achieve the trajectory for the sustainable development scenario. 
and this indicates the importance of increased policies policy support, especially to scale up sustainable bio, biofuel de deployment. So, um, so the import, so um, policy support for advanced ethanol, uh, advanced, advanced biofuels, and facilitate innovation for advanced bio, and and facilitate innovation for advanced biofuels is very important. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yoko. I mean, we said that we would take up uh, a maximum one hour of your time. We have a couple of minutes left. And if you allow, I'm going to ask um, Mike Waldron to say a few words, cast the net slightly wider and look at the look at how this plays into some of the, the work that's being done under the uh, SEM Investment and, and, and Finance Initiative. Um, we haven't dealt with all of your questions, um, but we, we, we can get back, get back in touch with you by, by email just to follow up on a couple more points. Um, um, so please, if you if you didn't get an answer uh, already, we hope to get back in touch with you shortly. But to, to wrap this up, uh, Mike, do you want to say a few words? Yes, I'll be extremely brief. Um, so as the, the cover slide of this presentation suggested, um, this is a webinar being done under the, the auspice of the of the Clean Energy Ministerial Investment in Finance Initiative, uh, which is about a year old. It was launched at, uh, at SEM 9 last year in Copenhagen. Um, there's a number of SEM countries uh, who are members, and at, even at SEM 10 this year, which is in Vancouver in about a week and a half, um, the initiative will be sponsoring an event on mobilizing energy investments on the 27th of May, uh, which will bring together a lot of public and private perspectives. Um, there'll be a minister's level investor roundtable at the SEM itself, um, so it'll be a discussion on uh, sustainable investment and the role of government policies therein. Um, as well as in June, there is an event that the European Commission is hosting um, under the initiative on energy efficiency financing during the Commission's uh, Sustainable Energy Week. And broadly, the, the focus of the initiative is to try to share uh, lessons learned, best practice, good analytical information on the financing of renewables, on the financing of energy efficiency, on um, grid infrastructure, and then some of the interactions with, with government policy to, to make those happen. So um, you'll be seeing more in this space in the sort of months um, and, and years ahead, hopefully. And uh, with that, I would just thank you very much for joining. And um, we'll get back to you with the questions. And as well, if you have further questions for us on the World Energy Investment Report, um, you can contact us at investment at IEA.org. So thank you very much indeed, Mike, and thanks very much to you all for your engagement. Um, we will be more than happy to continue this conversation offline, uh, but for the moment it just remains to say thank you again and thanks to the colleagues who participated today.